y'all good morning so i'm here with another reading vlog which i haven't done a reading vlog in a while but this one is for the here our voices tour for the book loretta little looks back so sorry about all the noise little one is is playing on her keyboard but i am like i said reading this for the here our voices tour and i was just really excited about this one because of the fact that this is a historical fiction book and it's done by a really prolific children's author and i was like when i got the opportunity i was like yeah, yeah, yeah i definitely want to do this one so one of the coolest things about this book is that it touches or i think it's going to touch a lot on some historical aspects related to the black community and one thing already that <laughs> that I'm really enjoying about this one is that it is touching on sharecropping. And one of the quotes that I like, I'm going to be telling you some of my favorite quotes as I read it. One of the quotes that I really enjoyed from this already was that even the chickens, the farm chickens had more freedom than sharecroppers. And it's so true because I think a lot of times people think that slavery, you know, once it was abolished, that was it. You know, we think civil war, slavery was abolished. And then all of a sudden, the black community was instantaneously free. And that's not true. A lot of people look at sharecropping as another form of slave bondage, which in a lot of ways, it's not formally slavery, but it was a way to continue to suppress black people. If you think about the grand scheme of things and how sharecropping works, I think it is true that it, it is another form of of slavery we're going to continue to read i'm going to continue to read and right now like i said i already started so i'm 10 percent in and i'm just learning a little bit about loretta's family and her siblings and the fact that they are sharecroppers and how that's come mm -hmm. to affect their livelihood and loretta yeah. is speaking about how yeah. sharecropping is another form of bondage yeah. and how it's it's hurt their family and that they have no freedom so the guy who actually owns the land is just he's not physically cruel but 50 percent of the crops that they get they have to give to him i'm gonna continue and then i will do another check-in later hey y'all so just doing another quick check-in i am about 20 percent in to the book and it is a difficult read in the sense that you are really learning about how sharecroppers are treated and how even when Loretta and her family are promised certain things like if you pick an X amount of cotton then I'll pay you this amount and knowing that there's a high chance that the owner of the land is not going to pay you and you just have to take a risk and then when they don't follow through there's nothing you can do about it like you can't there's no suing there's no arguing there's no nothing because Without land, without money, you couldn't do anything. So you're stuck in this continuous position of having to work for someone, but you can never own anything. You could never have any crops to call your own. And that's why I said earlier in that other clip that this is kind of like a new form of slavery. So like I was saying, we're all taught slavery ended, but there were ways that this nation kept black people in means of servitude and sharecropping definitely is one of those things where it's like you want to have land you want to own land but you can't and when you try to enter these deals in order to acquire land the person who you're working with just cheats you and there's nothing that you can do about it and i always say like land ownership is a big part of where generational money comes from and black people have not had that opportunity to own land it has been so difficult we were promised 40 acres and a mule post-slavery and when andrew johnson gets into office the first thing that he does is basically retract that and say that he's not going to do it and he gives reparations to the confederate army so it's just this endless cycle and kind of seeing that and reading about that in this book is is so hard and to know that loretta is only at 12 at the point that this first thing goes on so we're headed um to go to our park and i will check in with you all when we get to the park and maybe i'm able to read a little bit more
so I am about 30% in. I just switched perspectives. So the first perspective was from Loretta and this perspective is from Rolly. I believe Rolly, I think this is his name. And I believe that we have a third perspective as well. So there were a couple of things. I'm not giving exact quotes here, which is, and it's so hard to say favorite quotes because a lot of the things that are standing out to me as great quotes are really traumatizing things. But there was a section right before something happened with Loretta's dad where she talked about her sisters being okay, getting like pig's feet and stuff, like secondhand meat that no one else wants. And that really reminded me how my great grandmother used to tell me all the time that when she was growing up and just for some context, my great grandmother was, was born in 1926. Uh, she used to tell us that they would eat whatever was left. There was no choice meat. So as much as we like to talk about choice meat now and, and what our preferences are, there was no such thing as preference for them. They took whatever they could get. And I think that section just really stood out to me because I know that's what my great grandmother had to go through, eating stuff like pig's feet and, and chitlins and stuff like that, because that was all that was available to them to eat. So I always find that interesting. And then uh, there was a section in which Loretta had to go see the doctor. I won't specifically say what happened to her at the doctor's office, but I will say that it speaks highly to the relationship between black people and the medical profession and how she had heard rumors about the fact that whenever you go to the doctor, be mindful and don't trust them because they'll give you something called the black pill. And when you get the black pill, what ends up happening is that people end up disappearing, dying. So I found that interesting because that speaks to the experimentation that a lot of black people face and some people still have those lingering traumatic effects of not wanting to see a doctor because of the fact that black people have a horrible history with the medical profession and the amount of experimentation that was done on black people to advance certain aspects of the medical field. I think it's really interesting that our authors are really not only just talking about this family and their experience and their story of sharecropping and how the three sisters found Rolly, who now we're getting this perspective, like they found him because there were times when black women had to give up their children because they couldn't take care of their children and pull in enough cotton at the same time. So they just prayed that somebody would find their child and take care of them. And it's just amazing that we're seeing not only just the the story of this family, but just the experiences of black families throughout these decades. We start as early as the 1920s and now we're, we're moving up into the 1950s and we're seeing exactly what has happened, how black people have tried to survive and make it. And this is written for a middle grade audience. So of course things are not explicit. There's nothing in here content wise that's like, questionable in terms of what's being revealed to younger age groups but it's still a history that is super important which is why I titled this video black history is U.S. history because a lot of times for children to learn about stuff like this they have to take a black history class or an African-American history class which is befuddling because at the end of the day black history is so ingrained in u.s history they they're there they shouldn't necessarily always be considered two separate entities and a lot of times we don't learn about things in relationship to this country and the black community because it has to be a specialized class instead of teaching it for what it is and for what it was and educating our kids at a young age like i shouldn't have to think about the fact that oh you know when my daughter starts taking history classes i'm gonna have to teach her our history while she's also in a U.S. history. It's it's befuddling. But uh, yes, so I'm going to continue to read. I'm really enjoying it. There's a lot of history, a lot of aspects of it that I am really, really enjoying. And a lot yeah. of stuff that, you know, I am or have been aware of. But there's some things too that I'm, I'm learning about. So that's really fun. But we're going to keep walking and then I'll probably pause at another stop and read a little bit while she plays with her keyboard and then we will do another check-in.
Okay, so hopefully y'all can hear me. I decided to stop at Starbucks and get a peach green tea because like I've been telling y'all, like coffee is just not really working for me. So I decided to get a peach green tea and a chocolate croissant. And I just wanted to do a quick update before we head home. I am in the process of hitting the last perspective, which is Aggie B. I won't tell you who Aggie is because it's kind of a spoiler who she is, but I finished the last part of Roland section, Roly's section, excuse me. And what I really loved about Roly's section is at the very end, we transitioned to Mississippi, which I don't think I said that this whole book takes place in Mississippi. And it's about 1955 in Mississippi when Roley's section ends and he talks about how Mississippi is known as the Magnolia State and the Hospitality State. But it's only the Hospitality State depending upon who you are and what you look like and how Jim Crow is basically on the rise and that it's pretty much running everything and that you, if you're black, you are not welcome. It's not hospitable and it's not a good place to live in. He even delves a little bit into Emmett Till. And I just really liked the analogies that she was creating in it. I think it was really interesting. So I, like I said, I'm at Aggie's part and there's some interesting relationships going on with Aggie. And I believe this is still in the fifties. So I'm interested to see how it works and how it functions but yeah so we are going to continue to go it's my turn so i will check in later hey y'all so this is my final check-in i am actually about to go to sleep and i was like oh i forgot that i need to do a final check-in because i did finish the book and i think i'm going to end up giving it four stars it was really really great it was really really intriguing and I finished the last part which was Aggie's part like I said I'm not going to tell you how the characters are connected because I think that's quite a bit of a spoiler but Aggie was just interesting because Aggie's part was definitely mainly during the civil rights era so we got a lot of characterizations of voter registration and voter suppression and the craziness that people had to go through in order to be able to vote and I think that that's such a timely thing considering that we are in the midst of an election year I mean we are like a month and some change out from election and I think it's just fascinating to read this book knowing that it comes out this month and it is so timely and it's so important to have these conversations about voter suppression and how it has been so difficult for black people to exercise their ability to vote and there is some voter suppression that still happens today and it's really sucky but it does happen and it's really sad that it happens but it does happen i think what i liked about this this novel as a whole is that it really captures the journey that black people have had to make in terms of equality and equity in this country from the 1920s up into the 1960s and how i think like i've been saying in this entire vlog how there's this assumption sometimes that you know once slavery was over everything was good and i think that has to do with the fact that black history is not considered u.s history so a lot of people miss the fact that you had elements like sharecropping going on like we saw with loretta's character and how it is extremely difficult to get out of that cycle of constantly having to owe somebody something and you never have any land ownership you never have any wealth to pass on to your family so it's kind of this understanding of why people need to understand the whole essence of privilege and that we're not all starting from the same point. You think about the fact that a lot of wealthy people have had land ownership, land passed down from family, you know, generation to generation to generation, and that's equity. And black people haven't had that same opportunity. And we see that in this book, especially in that discussion, when we are looking at Loretta's experience and sharecropping and having to take over and having to make ends meet and 
it's sad when you see black people even be able to make a step forward they end up getting pushed back because there are certain people that don't want to or didn't want black people to succeed so people would do everything and anything that they could to stop black people and i think a lot of times it's easy for people to say oh pull yourself up by your own bootstraps but the civil rights movement was what i mean i'm horrible at math but we're talking 60 years ago 60 years ago we have family members still living today who experience the overt racism of the 50s and the 60s i mean jim crow i have family members i my mom <laughs> is a product of the jim crow era my dad is a product of the jim crow era so it's very hard to listen to criticism like that when you still are you're only a generation let's put it this way you're only a generation out of the craziness that black people have experienced so there's a lot to unpack in this book i think it is a great middle grade book i think content wise and length in in material i feel like it's more middle grade than children's but it was written in a way that there's access to a lot of black history in this about 40 year time period between these three characters and we see things from their different perspectives another thing that i really enjoyed in this book was that there is this conversation of black people not being a monolith so i think for the most part most black people were trying to get themselves out of jim crow they wanted to be free from Jim Crow but the methods in which people decided to go about freeing themselves from Jim Crow were completely different. So you had people who were more geared into the philosophy that Martin Luther King had which is definitely non-violent resistance. Then you had people who follow the path of Michael, Malcolm X which an eye for an eye and you had people who just didn't want to get involved at all who just felt like this was the card that we had been dealt and this is where we needed to be staying and that conversation does happen that everybody is not on the same page and that there were instances where even the black community itself internally struggled with saying like if you want to stir up trouble you've got to get out of our neighborhood because you can't be basically stirring stuff up and expect us to have to live with your consequences so there's a lot of interesting conversations not just externally in the relationship between black and white people and black people in this country but also the relationship that black people had with each other in this country and how we were put in positions where it it caused a dichotomy between the black community not just in choosing which path of resistance we wanted to take but also whether we wanted to resist or or not in general and I think that sometimes that's overlooked the group that didn't want to have anything to do with it like not saying that they wanted to be a part of Jim Crow but they also didn't want to stir the pot and cause any issues and get themselves killed or get their livelihoods destroyed but little livelihood they did have but overall like I said I really enjoyed this book I think that it's important to remember like I say with this title and probably like I've said a hundred times in this video that black history is u.s history and it's so easy to forget that because it's not taught black history is not taught at all really in our school systems and it's so unfortunate because you can see with everything that's been happening in the country this year that people are amazed and unaware of a lot of things that the black community has experienced and that comes from a lack of education and that comes from our school systems kind of failing us in terms of properly educating everyone about black history so i think that if you're looking for a very slow burn start to that educational process in terms of history not just anti-racism because part of me also feels like it's kind of hard to be an anti-racist if you don't know the history of the people that you are trying to ally yourself with so if you want to learn it just a brief synopsis of some of the historical events that happened from the 20s to the 60s told from these fictional perspectives but drawing very much so on real historical accounts with real historical figures i definitely would recommend this book i also like that this book is written in monologue style and in, in or very play like there was a way that the author described it and i, I want to actually look for the correct terminology because i feel like i'm going to get it wrong but there 
is a way that this is written where it almost is setting the stage for a character. So at the beginning of chapters, she describes what the character is doing, what the place or setting and time period is, and it it really does create the stage. And in the author's note, she talks about how it's easier for for students or for for children and middle grade age children to understand text much better when they're putting literally putting themselves in the shoes of the characters so she calls it dramatic form so it literally feels like you are watching a play happen even though it's not directly a play she sets it up like it is a play which I think is great I think it is more accessible for children in that way and it really does create a certain atmosphere of the book so I enjoy that as well but if you've never heard of this book I believe it releases on the 29th I always am so horrible about release dates unless I have it sitting right in front of me but I'm like 99% sure this releases September 29th so definitely check it out it's great the illustrations are great as well if you've never heard of these authors um, Andrea Davis Pickney and also Brian Pickney I definitely would recommend checking them out I've read other stuff by them more so in the picture book arena than in chapter book or middle grade but definitely check them out they're a great duo I listened to her speak this year in April at a school library journal event and she's just she's just an amazing human so definitely check that out and as always if you like this video give it a thumbs up if you want to see more content from me click the subscribe button if you want to support my channel follow me on social media all those links will be down in the description box below and I'll be back with a, another video soon Thank you.